Okay, electrolyte in on starch. Part of the important food biological molecules series. Uh, okay, so starch, uh, which you, you're well aware it's a polysaccharide, usually made out of glucose, found in large amounts in stable foods such as potatoes, wheat, corn, sometimes called maize, rice, and cassava, uh, and a range of others. So it's very important in human nutrition around the world, these starch uh, containing plants. Plants, of course, use starch to store energy, as their store is polysaccharide, and we also use it for energy as well. Uh, okay, so starch contains two polysaccharides. Amylose, which has a straight chain, and as usual there just means a big number, thousands, tens of thousands. Uh, and the other one is a straight, uh, the other one, I beg your pardon, is a branch chain, amylopectin. Uh, as I mentioned before, they are both chains of glucose residues. There's a branch, a branch here, of course. Amylose is linked by 1,4 glycosidic bonds. Uh, that is bonds linked by an oxygen between carbons 1 and carbon 4 of adjacent glucose residues. Uh, so in terms of human uh, metabolism, we have a particular enzyme that would be able to digest that, uh, be able to break those bonds. It's probably an endo endo uh, enzyme, so it starts at the end, which is one of the reasons why we can't digest starch until it's been broken out into smaller amounts. It would simply take too long for the endo enzymes to work their way along. Um, on the other hand, amylopectin is linked by 1,6 like acidic bonds, uh, bonds between carbon 1 and carbon 6. Um, whether we can, I can't remember offhand whether we have enzymes that can digest them, these, our good bacteria probably have. But again, of course, it's a different enzyme. Okay, it's a comparison of the uh, two chain lengths. I'm not going to read through that. Uh, looking at the bonding that takes place, chain length. Uh, we notice for amylopectin, millions of residues, potentially, and the average branch length. Okay, there's uh, one way of drawing it out. Uh, we'll notice immediately amylopectin forms a regular branch structure. Uh, and we'll notice that the green ones are, in fact, uh, links involve, uh, involving 1, 4, 6 links. So that's where branch points form, basically. So that's going to the branch chain format. Another way of looking at the branch structure, uh, we'll notice there are three distinct types of chain, with the simplest one being the C chain, which is on the reducing end. If you can remember what that is, let's look up reducing sugars again and think about the aldehyde group. Uh, starch granules, obviously we get starch from food in the form of granules, where it's uh, say used by the plants to store energy. Uh, pretty small. Um, they all have something called a helium, here, which is a point for which layers of, it says in the notes, protein, that should be carbohydrate, of course, uh, starch. In tubers, bulbs and rhizomes, helium is often off center with growth rings emanating outwards from it. Uh, lamellae, which are, is another word for layers, basically, of amylose and amylopectin are, te are packed together in each granule. Ah, yeah, so it forms growth rings. Uh, as they grow out, as the amylopectin molecules grow out from the helium, they produce a characteristic tree-like formation, so a bit like uh, growth rings in trees. X-ray crystallography has identified alternating crystal and amorphous regions. Uh, we'll talk about what we mean by crystalline in a moment. The crystalline regions contain branched amylopectin structures. The amorphous regions contain amylose molecules that are more randomly arranged. And there's just a simplified version of the same information. Um, yeah, so here's a, a walk through the hierarchical structure of starch granules and the model, that's the big circular thing at the bottom, representing the distribution of amylose and amylopectin molecules. Uh, so we start off with granules. If we, we, we drill in from the sort of we something we would see, I guess, in an optical microscope, a granule. We slice them, we see growth rings, we then see there's blocks. The blocks are made out of helices. The helices are made out of the layers we call lamellae. Then there's a double helical structure. And then there's the branching structure we saw earlier. And, and then there's the individual branching structures. Um, so it's quite a complex structure, which, of course, when we cook, we very largely destroy in the same way as we denature proteins, in a way that's analogous anyway. 
Okay, which brings us to starch gelatinization and retrogradation. Uh, starch gelatinization is an important factor in food production in, involving foods that contain significant amounts of starch. Uh, it's a factor which happens through heating. We'll have a look at the various different consequences of that uh, as we go through the rest of the lecture. But you can, read, you, can, you can stop the video or read the presentation and read the, what's, what it's got on the slide. So starch retrogradation, a process which occurs uh, when, in which disaggregated amylose and amylopectin chains in a gelatinized starch paste reassociate to form more ordered structures. Uh, it happens to storage, so these structures which, uh, you know, perhaps been cooked, it's been cooked, so it's broken down the original structure, start to, and it's said to be amorphous, that is to say they don't have much of a regular structure. But over time they start to form regular structures. Uh, which unfortunately can affect the organoleptic properties of the starch containing food. Uh, so it's saying there are amylopectin, short term changes in rheology, so the flow characteristics, amylose, much more short term and rapid changes that take place. And there's a, a good review there if you're interested in having a look at starch retrogradation. Uh, we're interested in the practical consequences. Yeah, so starch gelatinization. When we heat up starch uh, for cooking, we add thermal energy in water by hydrolysis. It also breaks hydrogen bonds between the chains. Uh, the sites w were involved in hydrogen bonding can now bond to water molecules, ca causing swelling and ingress of more water, which is why your gra rice grains go from a uh, very sort of dry and discreet to, uh, to to much more sort of fluffy type rice. Not to, uh, yeah, so it's because of added water, broken down hydrogen bonds and swollen. So it's a, a risotto. A good rice spoil, if I'm my opinion, but there we are. Uh, anyway, uh, starch is placed in water and heating. Gelatinization increases with increase in temperature until the starch granule breaks down to produce a gel. If it's overcooked, a colloid results. Now, you may remember a colloid is a where we have an insoluble molecule dispersed but not dissolved in a, in a, another substance. Uh, we talked about this a few times earlier. Um, this may be undesirable in food production terms. Yeah, so an example of uh, a colloid we've discussed before would be oil and water mixed together to some mayonnaise. Uh, in this case, that's a good example of a colloid being unstable. So here's one you can try at home, take some starch, make a paste from it. Uh, people may do this for their own amusement already. Yeah, so producing a paste. Uh, pastes are very important in, in food technology and food, in food production. Uh, to produce a paste, gelatinized starch is heated in a large volume of water, and the paste has a relatively high viscosity, so it doesn't flow that much. Uh, it, 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 it's got quite slow flow characteristics. And there's just summary of the process. Uh, you will notice uh, a couple of steps are sort of reversible between starch granules and swollen granules. Not completely reversible, and similarly between starch paste and gels. Again, there is some reversibility, but not so much. Uh, not complete reversibility. You will notice you know, this heating, heating and shearing. Shearing is obviously when you heat in a in a blender that provides uh, provides shearing force, which is the one the one we have in the food lab. Uh, that's not reversible, nor is the gel uh, gelatinization to retrograde, retrograde starch we see in storage, of which more in a moment. Okay, crystallization. Although described as crystallization, this refers to repeating regular structures rather than discrete crystal forms such as in sodium chloride or diamond. But if you look at the process, it's quite analogous to normal crystal formation. Uh, many of you have tried and possibly failed to make a crystal garden. This would how it this would how it would work with traditional crystals. Uh, again, it's it's associated with how the starch granule grows from the helium outwards. So nucleation is the formation of the initial starch, and it propagates outwards, and eventually becomes so large that it becomes just slow growth. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's a, a, a typical sort of measurement that's done in the food industry, looking at the effect of viscosity. Uh, shear speed, um, temperature, on gelatinization of the factors. And again, if you're interested, there's a link through, I think, I think from one of these things, or it's in the notes anyway. Yeah, so, retrogradation of starch. Why doesn't the rice taste as good the next day? Why does the bread go stale? 
This is due to retrogradation. When starch paste is left to cool, it partially recrystallizes and in doing so expels water. Uh, this makes the food harder and possibly less acceptable. So as we talked about in the starts off with the granules, highly organized, we heat it up, it becomes a gel, and then it retrogrades to form semi-random structures which affect the texture of the food. Yeah, said to be recrystallized, which is a sort of funny word in this context, but it's it seemed reasonable, I guess. Uh, yeah, so there's a graph to summarize the links between viscosity, temperature, and grain size. I think it's self-explanatory. Yeah, so back to uh, retrogradation, and one of the th one of the reasons why bread becomes stale is because water is expelled from it—a process which we describe as synergesis. Again, if you're interested to see Wang et al. Uh, which was referenced a few slides back for more details. The consequence of this, of course, is that uh, the synergesis expels water and the bread becomes harder. harder. That is to say, it becomes stale. It's just not. It's not just a question of bread losing water. It's it's changes in the starch structure of the bread as well. So where to store the bread? Uh, I think it's a question you can ask yourself before we you move on the slide or pause the video. Should we store it in the bread bin? Should we store it in the refrigerator? Or should we store it in the freezer? Roll of drums. One place we shouldn't store it is in the fridge at fridge temperatures. When bread is stored in a cold but above freezing environment, the recrystallization and staling happens at a much faster rate than at warmer temperatures. Freezing, however, will drastically slow the, pro slow the process down. Uh, yeah, just to wrap up, uh, it's a little bit of a link to some talk about modified starch. And there's a definition of modified starch. Starch is about a mono original characteristics altered by treatment in accordance with good manufacturing practice by one of one of a range of procedures. That's a quote from the Food and Agriculture Organization. And there's quite a lot more information in the notes here. And we'll notice, for example, that they uh, many of these have an E, e number, such as E1404, which would, of course, be displayed in the product package. Uh, so very important in a lot of food technology applications. And just to wrap up this video, as uh, Amando Hasdrigan's video on starch, which as usual is excellent. Uh, the middle section review structure, although you may want to watch the whole video. Alright, so there we are, and thanks for listening.